Come get your victory at the table. Let's talk. Let's talk. Come get your victory at the table. Let's talk. Let's talk. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on whatever time you have decided to tune in with us. We would like to welcome you to another episode of Victory at the Table Talk, where we have down-to-earth conversations about various topics to assist with your walk with Christ. Here at the table, you can get the victory, but you can also get a taste of Victory Apostolic Church right here in Matson, Illinois, where we are building victorious Christ-like lives. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Victory at the Table Talk. My name is Dr. Arliss Whalum and I am the CEO of Victory Association. Our organization believes that the training of leaders will transform an organization, a church. And so in that spirit of uh, leadership training, we have asked Minister Dantasia Jackson to my left and Senior Pastor Andrew D. Singleton Jr. From, to my right Praise Lord. of Victory Apostolic Church to talk to us about five very important aspects of leadership. Influence, priorities, character, creating positive change, and problem solving. So let's listen in to their exchange. Thank you, Dr. Arliss, for that wonderful introduction. They say everything rises and falls on leadership. So we're going to get right to your leadership journey, Pastor Singleton. Is that okay? That's fine, Evangelist Dantasia. <laughs> <laughs> so in our wonderful book, um, Developing the Leader Within You by John C. Maxwell, he talks about leadership as an influence and defines leadership as the ability to obtain followers. In your leadership journey, what nuggets did you learn to help you with this concept? Well, I learned, first of all, it is true. Uh, it's, it, it, it's true. Whether good or bad, leadership is ultimately about influencing uh, others. Uh, it has been said that if you say you're a leader and you look around and no one's following you, you're only taking a walk. <laughs> Leaders gain followers. And it just moving from bad to good. Uh, we uh, history gives us examples uh, such as Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. and dare I say Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> as at least from my opinion, uh, exa examples of, of bad mm -hmm. leadership. But mm -hmm. yet, no one can deny their influence. So I would believe we're talking about especially from Maxwell's book which I have read both copies of because this this is really his original books it goes back into the 1990s when I was really starting to grow mm -hmm. as a leader mm -hmm. his developing the leader within you originally mm -hmm. his developing the leaders around you and so I'm glad he's updated uh, uh the book but for us we're really focusing more on good leadership and that is spiritual leadership and that spiritual leadership and we start talking about influence Spiritual leadership is at its best when the leader is influenced by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm. Amen. And Amen. we call that in the Bible being full of the Holy the Spirit. Spirit. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are young in the Bible, they think being full of the Holy Spirit means like you're getting the Holy Spirit again or you full. No, it, it really means that a person who is really being used by God is as under much influence by the Holy Spirit as a person is intoxicated and under the influence of wine. Because the scriptures even tell us in Ephesians, you know, uh, don't be intoxicated with wine, but be full of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So he also describes um, his model of influence as the five, he describes five level, levels of leadership. Correct. Um, and what leaders, from your perspective, reach that fifth level, that pinnacle level of leadership? Well, let's back it up a little bit because some people are going to say, well, you got to five. What's happened to one, two, three, and four? <laughs> well, they so, got to read the book, Pastor. I know, <laughs> I know. I'm to just, get to one, but two, it's important. I'm going to okay, do it in a sentence okay, or two. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, the lowest level of leadership 
within a nonprofit context uh, is the leadership of position. Mm -hmm. And I say within a nonprofit context because in a working environment, the position of authority is very important right. because these people can fire you. Right. <laughs> so me. it's different. <laughs> it's different in a corporate setting. It's different in a corporate setting. But when you're in a church setting, uh, there's no money involved in it. Positional authority doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. So there mm -hmm. are other things that he talks about in these other uh, steps, one through four, uh, mm -hmm. that people like you. Uh, people respect you, people right. can see what you have achieved, and those become the staircases that you move up mm -hmm. and keep building on your level of influence as a leader. So the fifth level is the pinnacle, right. uh, which he changed the title of, of in this book. In his first book, he called it Personhood. Mm -hmm. He changed the title for pinnacle. I still like personhood better, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> At that fifth level, very few people achieve it. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason very few people achieve it is, is because it is earned over long periods of time. That a person's life, their character, their achievements, what they've accomplished have been just almost that everyone knows. Uh, a few people like that, uh, of course, number one for me would be my pastor, uh, Bishop Arthur Brazier. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had to name, obviously, Dr. Martin Luther King would be considered uh, another, Mother Teresa. These people transcend. Um, it's hard to explain, but they reach a, a level at which their influence is, is so great, it, like, permeates wherever they go. They, they have something about them that, as Bishop Brazier had, that even when they walk into a room, it's like the whole room changes when that person comes in. So very few people are consistent enough in their character, uh, consistent enough in their achievements to attain the pinnacles. But do you think that is difficult for a person, an average person as myself, to reach that level? The average person will never reach it. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I'm not saying, and she states in the book, I'm not saying it's not a goal, mm -hmm. but very few people uh, accomplish it. I mean, you almost have to have a laser-like focus on your life. And I disagree with him a little in the book, because you don't agree with everything the Absolutely. author says. He says something you, you seek to uh, accomplish. Uh, you know, I don't think Bishop Brazier ever sought to accomplish personhood. I just think he became it. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, okay. So he also stated that the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 principle or the 80-20 rule, I like to call, mm -hmm. that was on page like 34, um, mm -hmm. helped him. What are your thoughts around this principle? The, the principle in generalities is true. Uh, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of so the church at work. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things we can apply the Pareto rule to. Mm -hmm. It's not always true. I can give you a great example. During our capital campaigns, I was told, and I've done several multi-million dollar campaigns, uh, I was told that one-third <laughs> of the people, the members, were going to give two-thirds of the total campaign. Mm. Unfortunately, that was very true. <laughs> But but so I do think the Pareto rule is good, and it's just trying to let us understand that a little, if we're talking about people, end up many times doing a lot of, of the work. work. I call mm -hmm. them at Victory the AA people. Uh, mm -hmm. For those who are listening, we're not, <laughs> not alcoholics. Anonymous. <laughs> it's, it's able and available. The people mm -hmm. I have I like that. that have ability. Mm hmm and, and also at the same time that they are available are probably that 20% Pareto rule. Mm -hmm. And then he also talks about like the three R and you talk, so you added like the AA, which is the able and available, right? Which you talked about that. He talks about the three R's, which is requirement return and reward uh, to Correct. help leaders become proactive in identifying their priorities. Mm -hmm. So how have you used these, three R's to um, help you with prioritizing? Well, uh, I put my requirements down, and these are the things that I cannot uh, delegate. One of the things that happened during uh, the pandemic, uh, there, were, there were blocks of time that I was going probably from 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, 8, 9 o'clock at night straight. And my wife became very, very concerned about me, uh, and, you know, I know I can at times be defensive, so I was determined to hear her out. 
So I made sure I would hear her by, and she said she wanted to talk to me in a nice, kind voice. I said, okay, I'll listen. I went and got me some Kellogg Corn Flakes. And I, <laughs> well, excuse me, Sugar Frosted Flakes. And I sat there and ate and listened to her. Mm-hmm. And because I knew I couldn't interrupt her if I'm chewing. <laughs> That's a good concept like to use. Yeah. <laughs> See, you marry people out here. Yes. You want to let your wife here out? Get some cornflakes. Corn just, just be chewing. <laughs> now, everybody's going to go out and buy all the cornflakes. Because yeah. <laughs> it goes for, well, you know, wives and husbands as well. Well, you know, just a slight <laughs> digression. These things should be free flowing. Right. Uh, you know, you do what is necessary to listen. Years ago, I was dealing with a couple in counseling who uh, the husband's biggest problem was his wife would not listen. So she figured it out. She literally brought every counseling session a box of paper clips, and she broke them all during the uh, meeting. Like if she disagreed with them, she'd just break another paper clip. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't interrupt them. She right. never she never interrupted them. Mm-hmm. So as I listened to my wife and let her finish, because one of the comments she made is that I was no longer 40. I said, well, I used to do this all the time. She said, well, you ain't 40 no more. You're seven. I said, well, that's true, and I appreciate how much you love and concern me. Then I asked her this question. I said, uh, what will you have me to do? Do you have any answers? Mm-hmm. And she even told the church lady, she said she had no answers. Mm-hmm. And I knew why she didn't have no answers, because she's not the leader. I'm the leader. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's certain things I cannot delegate. I am the visionary. I am the shepherd. I am the CEO. That's okay. not a haughty thing. Well, we're going to hold reality. that question because okay. I don't want you to steal my thunder. when we. I ain't going to steal this. your thunder. Okay. No kind right. of way. <laughs> okay. Well, how do you prioritize? I mean, what do you do to prioritize your day? What I do leader? is, and I've been doing this since I was in, working in corporate. Uh, I, I generally have with me what I call my TTDs. Uh, things to do mm. and uh, they may be sometimes on their list there are three or four sometimes there are 15 different things and because I guess I just got problems I get the biggest kick out of it by the end of the day all 15 are done nice and what it does is it, it makes me focus it, it makes me prioritize mm-hmm. it makes me not get distracted in an environment as a senior pastor that is so easy to be distracted i mean i can be working on something i get an emergency call this person's in the hospital mm-hmm. pastor i have to see you right now and so it kind of helps me maintain my my focus as far as on a day-to-day basis so what I, what of your work or your priority give you the greatest return in the ministry? It's seeing God's people grow. Hmm. Shepherds you said that, love, you mentioned that on Sunday. <laughs> I'm, it, it's the truth. Mm-hmm. Shepherds, pastors love to see people grow. I'm not motivated by money. Money mm-hmm. is here today, gone tomorrow. And because, you know, I spent the first 50 plus years of my life not having no money, I'm not, even, I'm not impressed with it. Uh, it's, it's, it has its value. I, I, it's great not to be under financial pressures and all that. That's wonderful. But at the same time, you know, I'm called by God to help people grow, to see them say, see them receive the Holy Spirit, to see their lives change, to see them come out of difficult circumstances in which I play a role. I met with a brother today earlier who was going through three years ago, going through an incredibly difficult time. And he came in today to tell me good news about how God had taken it through. Then he was honest about how I am as a person. He said, but when you were counseling me, you were kind of rough there, pastors. <laughs> so I've heard that enough to know there's some real truth in that. And that's another thing we can talk about later. Mm-hmm. But, it, uh, you know, it doesn't help people to not tell them truth. Mm-hmm. I'm just not put together as a leader to just baby people. I'm just, I'm, if you, as my best friend used to say, you know, if you don't want the truth, don't go to Pastor Singleton. If you don't want the truth, <laughs> go find, if you want to find you Joe Olsen, somebody, right. he'll motivate you. Don't go <laughs> me because I'm going to truth because truth makes you aware and truth ultimately brings about change. Okay. And you talk about, I like that you talk about growing because John Maxwell states that there are four dimensions um, to character and that's part of growing. Mm-hmm. That's authenticity, self-management, humility, and courage. Mm-hmm. Do you agree? And are there other dimensions that you would add to this? I, I think that what he gave is very, very good. Um, but I would add a few more things. Okay. Uh, I would put charisma there. A part of leadership is not essential, but it is a part of it. A part of it is 
is that people are kind of drawn to you. I, I think it can go too far, especially in the African-American church. that are so many times driven by the personality and char- charismatics of the senior leader. Mm-hmm. But there are other things, though. I think he may have meant it under authenticity, but I didn't see him flat out stated. Uh, and integrity is just absolutely uh, critical because integrity represents wholeness. And I like Dr. Henry Cloud, uh, who uses the word integrity, and he said it is the courage to meet the demands of reality. And of course, he brings up courage as well in that. So a person has to be whole as far as that is concerned. And so another thing I would bring up would be, uh, as far as a real uh, strength, is perseverance. Uh, uh, senior leaders have to be very, very strong and, and have a vision. See, I, what I do on a day-to-day basis, my TTD, things to do. <laughs> but on a visionary perspective, that is goal-oriented, and I set goals that are long-ranging, and I have steps by which I seek to achieve those goals. Mm-hmm. That that is a visionary aspect. Like I said earlier, I cannot delegate that. Right. That's I right. can't delegate the shepherding of this church. I can't delegate my, my CEO responsibilities. So another thing I would say that's huge that we don't talk about is that turn that takes a lot of people out of the senior leadership and other leadership role is is taking criticism. Uh, there, there is nothing worse than doing everything that you know how to do and you get beat to death. So I literally just responded to a, a, lead, uh, a member. I don't know them personally. You know, we have thousands of people here, so I didn't recognize the name. But mm-hmm. she had very serious issues with my sermon on Sunday. A lot of times I don't respond. But it was a very well-written letter. And um, then she went to scripture. I'm not going to let you out scripture me as a member. That ain't <laughs> not going to happen. You know, I, I've been to school. <laughs> right. So... And I don't want to go through what it was about. I had to do with my mentioning so much about COVID, basically, that she had a, a, and getting vaccinated. Mm. And it was and it, and it was a critical letter. Uh, I brought my friends. Uh, we were disappointed. Uh, people who cannot take criticism can't lead to me. Mm-hmm. If you have to have people agree with everything you say, then you'll never be a servant of God. Never. When you study the New Testament, they lit the Apostle Paul up oh. almost in every book you go. That man was beat up. I mean, he was like a doormat. <laughs> but he stood. And even my pastor, Bishop Brazier, I remember him saying to me one time when he took a stand, a doctrinal stand on election, eternal security, and some other things, he said, I'll never be, Pat Elder Singleton, I will never become now because of my stand. I will never become the presiding bishop of the Pentecostal of the world, even though though he had by far the largest church and the most donations. Mm-hmm. But he, he taught me as a young man, he said, but I have not failed to declare the whole counsel of God. He, he knew I knew the scriptures, Acts 20 <laughs> and 28. And that's yeah. how I tried to live my life. So mm-hmm. it's, everyone likes to be agreed with, but I don't require that. Once the Holy Spirit speaks to me, which is definitely what happened Sunday, I had a whole nother message. I said that. Mm. I had a whole different message. The Lord said, no, wow. you ain't preaching that. So if you got to decide... Are you going to obey what God is telling you to do that people don't obedient. like? Mm-hmm. Or are you going to do what you feel like doing because people are going to like, like it? Mm-hmm. Then on this side, you're the motivational speaker. On this mm-hmm. side, you're the preacher. Mm-hmm. 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 So going back, thinking of, thinking of your leadership journey um, when you were young, um, what was your major or most challenging to you uh, building that character? Like what is a situation that you kind of... What happened in that time? Well, as a young leader, the most difficult thing that I had to build was people trusting me. Mm. Okay. My change was so dramatic and so fast from out of the world to into Christ. And within one year of being saved, a preacher and moving forward, it it was very difficult for, for me to get trust in people. And I began to understand even then my life had to match up or because people were looking for me not to be able to make it. What most people don't Mm. understand, once you say you're a leader, which is another something people don't like, once you declare that you're a leader, your life is under the magnifying glass. Amen. (laughs) Yes. I don't like it. Everyone, look. well, then don't do it. Go find something else to do. Correct. Because it is an unavoidable part of leadership. People watch everything I do. You know, in the men like to go to restaurants and they sit facing so that way they can protect their family, their wife. 
for the last few years, when I go to restaurants, I sit with my back because I don't want nobody to recognize me. Because <laughs> everything I do, you know, is under a microscope. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot. I don't necessarily enjoy it, but it comes with the, ter- ter- with the territory. Mm-hmm. So I had a difficult time building trust, which I believe over the years I have built. The second most difficult thing, I think, was humility. Uh, because I, I was a very arrogant individual. Uh, you couldn't tell me uh, anything, and God had to break that in me, and he broke it. And the third thing that I think was huge as a young leader was my impatience. Mm-hmm. I was not patient. Uh, and God had to learn and teach me how to slow down, how to let things develop, how not to let my anger get the best of me and not let my three kids who were little then drive me insane. <laughs> uh, so that played a role. Those were kind of the major things I, I would say. So I you, hope had that to, you had to change a lot of things. It, I just gave you some of them. <laughs> it, it's a whole lot. Trust me, y'all. It's a whole lot more than that. We're just getting We're just uh, scratching to the, the surface. To, to, the, to the top. <laughs> well, because John Maxwell, he talked about creating uh, positive change. So um, how did you create positive change as you stepped into your leadership roles? I created positive. I hope it's positive because sometimes we say we created positive change. We need to let other people say what you think you've done. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I'm serious because sometimes we'll, a person say they're a good father. Ask, ask your kids. You're a good that's wife. True. Ask the kids. You're a good husband. Ask the wife. You're a good mm-hmm. wife. Ask the husband. So in positive change, what one thing I've come to deal with, especially now, for those of you watching and maybe not a part of Victor, I just celebrated my 70th uh, birthday uh, in Happy March. Birthday. <laughs> change is an inescapable part of life. And I'm into this thing. Now, I'm not quite sure how to, to appreciate one, but, it, but uh, I, part of my 70th birthday, I dealt with my times are in God's hands from the scriptures. And it's the relentless nature of time and the change it brings that blows me away because the time keeps moving second by second, minute by minute, hour by day. You don't have to think about it or nothing. You don't have to, it, it just keeps happening. And it's not that time just keeps moving forward. Ultimately, time changes us. Mm-hmm. And we stop sometimes, and I do, stare in the mirror as a 70-year-old man, and I'm like, how did this happen? I was just 40. <laughs> How did this, I don't understand it, you know, right. but like a snap of the finger. So for me, change is inevitable. At Victory right now, without going through the details, and I'm sure this may connect to some of you who are in other churches, transitions are occurring all over the place, from, from finance to pastors, assistant pastors, other leaders. I have to deal with it. It is a natural part of life. It's the ability to deal with change. And I will say this, if any senior leaders are watching, one of the signs of the power of your ministry would be that as you make changes, especially in key positions in your church, that the people who replace people are either as good or better than the people they took over from. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. That's, that's, that is a real, that is a sign of an organization that has perpetuity. That is a sign of an organization that is going to be moving to higher heights in, in Christ Jesus. That's true. So credibility creates authority. Do you agree with that? No question about it. Okay. That's why I don't play with it. <laughs> so what credibility influenced the founding 12 members of Victory to align with your vision in the ministry? First, I like to feel they, they felt led of the Holy Spirit because they all said that, including my wife. The, the other thing that I think that, and I just shared this with a, 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 uh, an executive yesterday when we had a, a meeting, a former bank executive, because he was asking me similar questions. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, but after 18 years of Apostolic Church of God from 1978 to 1996, no one can deny that I did not leave with a good name. I had built that trust mm-hmm. over 18 years. And... As Bishop Braves used to say, because there were a few people that came in and attacked me with lies. Mm. And I can still hear Bishop Brazier telling one of them, no one in all these years has ever come in here and had anything to say about this man that was true. Mm. Wow. And I'm not trying to say you had to be perfect to be a a senior leader, because that's not true. None of us are perfect human beings. Mm. But at whatever point God gets a hold of a person's life, there must be consistency in that life. 
that causes people to say whatever they done in the past is in the past. That this person now has moved on and moved forward and I can put calm. Nobody wants to follow a loser. <laughs> but how did you feel about those lies that were being told? What did that do But now for you? I'm not how sure you, I understand. How did you feel about the lies that were being told on, you know, on you and how did it make you feel at well, that time? Well, anybody who lie on you make you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anybody, ooh, they lied. I'm happy. <laughs> you know, so lying, but here's the thing. It, it, let me tell you why it didn't bother me. A bishop took care of this at a seminar in the early 1980s for me. Mm -hmm. He said, the higher you rise in life, the more you're going to have accusations as a leader mm -hmm. he said you can never stop the accusations mm -hmm. he said but they should never have facts mm -hmm. That's right. true. i kept that right. a lie is still a lie mm -hmm. now we got technology that can make you know stuff look it's real fact, but right. it's still a lie right <laughs> and also when people know the character of that leader because there were certain things that bishop brazier reached a level and there were certain women hitting on him i'll just leave it at that but <laughs> I would tell people, oh, he could have done that, but ain't nobody going to believe that anyway. So, But that's all right. Leave that alone. But my <laughs> point is he reached such a level that people knew his character. And when people know the character, not that we can't fall because right. we can, right, right, right. but it's, it's very, very difficult because you're at a different place in Christ. Who gives up all? Why would I give up all that I've attained over 40 years of walking with God to be Based with on. some woman? Why right. would I do that? Right. Why, what would I gain from that? That's right. That's right. You know, short-term pleasure, long-term pain. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why would I do it? Right. So I, I think that the people who started with me and, and who stayed with me the whole time until they either moved or started their own churches, some of them still here now, uh, I did not play with that kind of trust in me. Okay. Okay. So dealing with, like, problem problem solving, um, have you or where did you make any mistakes in problem solving, young and even current? Well, I, I kind of make the same mistake all the time. I'm trying to do so much better with it. Uh, be, because a part that we didn't talk about of how leaders advance, I'm trying to teach pastors, is to help other people achieve their goals. goals. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of people trusting me. And mm -hmm. it's a principle that a lot of them can't get. So I drew once, I drew a picture of a big circle. And then I put all kind of things in it, like the, our gospel of justice ministry, our a victory Association, a taste of victory. And I was trying to help them understand is your vision as the senior pastor must be large enough to encompass what other people's visions are. Right. And for me, my one of my biggest mistakes that is I have, because I want people to succeed, right. I advance people too fast. That's been one of my biggest mistakes. And the reason for that is I want them to succeed, but it is in Maxwell's books. And I don't know if it's Maxwell saying, I read a lot of leadership books other than Maxwell, mm -hmm. but one of them make the comment that you should not put people into a position until they develop the character necessary for the position. Awesome. And I, and I have failed in that time, not just once time and time again. again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for my last and final question, what learning aspects of problem solving have you gained from your leadership journey and would like to share with the victory leaders? Well, that I'm going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> and you're human. <laughs> yeah. I've learned that. I am comfortable with failing. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable that understanding that a part of solving a problem is I'm not going to always get it right. Uh, one of the things that's really hurts me probably now more than ever as a senior leader as I age is I'm losing some relationships with people that I've had over many, many years uh, because they have felt that I have failed them in a time of crisis and maybe they're right. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're right. And, uh, but whereas I have been failed, but so many people failed me over the years mm -hmm. that I've had to forgive and move forward. No matter how I feel, yeah. I had, God had to come to help me understand the spiritual maturity level that I'm at. They're not at, mm -hmm. I'm at a different maturity level that understands I, I cannot move forward in my role as a leader. If I'm still carrying that kind of hurt, that kind of pain or betrayal and everything else I have to deal with, I have to on my knees and prayer, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the people have viewed me at very high lights here 
And as you've heard me say in recent sermons, if you yes. put me on a pedestal yes. that high, I will guarantee you one thing. Well, what's that, Pastor Singleton? Gonna I'm going to fail, fail you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I, I cannot live up to, I'm not a God. Yes. But in the black church, especially the senior leaders hell, and the, and the more that senior leader chiefs, so for a church that has gone from 12 to thousands of people, the trust that I have in people and how they view me, the way they view me is not actually me. I can't, I cannot live up to all those expectations. Mm-hmm. And and then the lack of the fact, and you said it, that I'm not even allowed to be a human mm-hmm. being, that certain things that have hurt me and devastated me, that I'm not allowed to feel that hurt. And instead of me being allowed to feel the hurt and pain, here, Singleton, let me dump some more, more stuff mm-hmm. on you. Mm-hmm. And I have to, and I do, I break down under that kind of pressure. And many times senior pastors, I talked to a lot of my friends who are senior pastors. And one of them said recently, he's a former Chicago bull. He says, you're right, Andy, Pastor Stingley, it is the mental anguish of this job. And this is what drives, especially the mega church past level to clinical depression, uh, some to committing suicide. The expectations and demands on what people I expect are impossible to meet. So I have become comfortable that from time to time I'm a fail. Because, see, a, a sign of a good leader is not no. that the good leader always make good judgments. The sign of a good leader is that the majority of the decisions are good. Nice. 80%. <laughs> <laughs> Since the 80 been, 20 since rule. Since we through the Pareto rule. In <laughs> right. here, you know, no, nobody gets it right all the time. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And a couple other things I just quickly want to uh, share. I, I think that it is so important as we begin to uh, to kind of wrap this up from the, from the, from the book. Mm-hmm. I do get a great return from people growing spiritually, but I also, I'm a person, knowing who I am, I get a great return for seeing the things like Gospel of Justice, Taste of Victory, Victor Association. I love new initiatives. Mm. And I love to see things get going. And the way I'm put together, once they get going, then I'm bored. <laughs> now You now, like the newness of it. It's, it's just how I'm put together. Now right. I'm off to the next thing. And that's right. how we've grown from just like to all these, because God keeps sending the people that once I have clear vision, and I don't get all the vision, some ministries like Dare to Be Daniel, that's not my vision. No, somebody else had that vision. Mm-hmm. But the majority of things that get in my head, God sends me the person, like a Dr. Whalum, the head of Victor Association, and we can move that forward, and I'm ready for what's next. next. <laughs> and another thing we didn't talk about was March, and I think we didn't mention yes. margin. We did not. Margin is critical here. Yes. Because margin deals with the difference between your load and your limits. Mm-hmm. And where I have grown in the last few years is I, I have stopped becoming, I've stopped being a workaholic. I, 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 you know, I, I could be at a table right now. I confess I am. I'd be at the 12-step <laughs> meeting right now. I am an alcohol, workaholic, you know. And one of my members have, helped me with, because Bishop Brazier was one of my pastor. I mean, this man went from 60-something members to 12,000, and I'm close to him. And, and so I tried to blame it on him, and Pastor Stratton here said, oh, no, you was like that. He, he You were like that before. You, he just made you into more of a monster, that's all. But as I get older now, I realize my times of relaxation refresh me. Mm. And it is the funniest thing, and Bill Heibel said in one of his books, I cannot explain how my grandchildren refresh me for a little while. It's important to throw a little while in because mm-hmm. after a while, they got to go. <laughs> 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 but for a while, for a few hours or so, I, it, I think what happens is they give me a sense of legacy. The other thing that refreshes me is my personal relationship with my wife. I mean, to be 47 years married uh, next month, and we have an incredibly healthy marriage. And one of the best things ever happened to Sister Singleton was to retire. Because <laughs> she's not feeling the stress yes. and pressure. She does not handle that in the way that I can. So it, it, our marriage is doing so much better to see all my kids achieving well and successful in their own rights and then watch them train up the next generation. Those are the things that create margin. I'm even learning now how to play golf and 
And, you know, a part of life is to enjoy all that you've been working so yes, hard yes, for. It's absolutely. nothing it's nothing wrong. I had to come to grips that there was something wrong with me that when I would be relaxing, I felt guilty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I know mm -hmm. I got somebody online. <laughs> I know. Yes, you do. Yes. And there's something, there's something wrong with that. Right, right. God wants us to relax. God wants us to be green and fresh. And under the kind of stress and pressure that I stay under constantly between my wife, between working out, be, between being with my kids and grandkids, that provides the, 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 the tension and stretch between work and load. So how do you create that white space in your calendar? I so make it happen. Okay. And I used to could not do it. I, I literally, uh, I would be up a typical day for me because we're talking about it. I'm right. up six, seven o'clock in the morning because I have to meet God before I meet some of y'all crazy people. I'm sorry <laughs> just to be, I'm just being myself. So I'm on my knees. I'm in prayer. I'm in devotion. Then I'm working on sermons, Bible classes. So by the time I get in here, now I got to switch hats. Now I'm the CEO and the pastor and I will work all day long four or five o'clock, go to dinner, come back for counseling sessions, meetings. That's not healthy. Mm -hmm. But so how do you make that time? Then? I make it now. Make I just, just I, I'm going to create time. it. Okay. And, and I got it. Y'all want to hear a true story? I hope this person not on this thing. I don't think they are. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, I just wanted to, uh, I simply wanted to barbecue in the evening. About the only thing I can do other than cook grits is barbecue. And, I had my day planned. I was going to, I canceled my appointment. Tell me, how do you make it? I canceled right. appointments for the afternoon. So I, I, I marked it out on my calendar. I just wanted to go home, sit in my back, relax. Nobody bothered me. Okay. This person had 11 o'clock appointment with me. Got there at 12. Mm. So I was getting ready to leave. So I said, well, come on in. Here's what we, here's what we can do. Let me ask you this. If it's urgent, what you need, I'll, I'll, I'll find, I will deal with it. And that person's immediate response to me was, that's your problem. Oh. You always so busy. Oh, I lit them up. I'm just going to tell Because that was your time. Then. No, I lit them up. Uh, and then he, that person was so shocked at me as the senior pastor. And, you know, when I say light up, people know me, my family. I don't use no profanity. No, no, no. no, no. But I was clearly angry. Mm -hmm. And she stared at me for about 20 seconds and then broke down crying. Then she leaves out the door. Everyone's at the front with the woman, and she crying. I leave. Everybody looking at me. What a terrible man I am. He done made the woman cry. But it came to grips with me. I asked myself later, why did I get angry, so angry? And then it hit me. I care so much for people, but nobody cares about me. That hurts. That hurts. Mm. That hurts. Mm -hmm. You just feel I'm something to dump your problems mm -hmm. on constantly. And I felt like you don't care nothing about me. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me getting a break? Mm -hmm. It wasn't urgent. All you had to say was, Pastor Singleton, oh, let's reschedule mm -hmm. it. You need some time away. Right. You need a break. She, when she said that, I felt unloved. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. I, now, she maybe didn't mean it that way because she may have viewed me like the garbage man. You know, garbage truck is built to put garbage in. So some people view the senior pastor like that. Just bring us all the garbage. We ain't no garbage trucks. <laughs> That's true. And That's I get true. tired of garbage. Garbage smells. <laughs> yes. Wow. So I just thought that would be helpful. Yes, and and uh, just letting you get a real insight to leaders, you have to take care of yourselves. Because the great work God has called us to do, Christianity and what we do is countercultural. We go out into a world of deep moral darkness, bringing the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to a world that no longer believes, right. to, to ministries that will just tell you how to name it and claim it, health and wealth, and don't even tell you the truth. Once you make the decision that you're going to be the man or woman for Jesus Christ, you're going to be criticized. But remember this, one day is not before men you're going to stand. And give an account of your ministry. You're going to have to stand before God, continue to grow and uh, develop in your leadership abilities. God bless you. Well, thank wow. you so much, Pastor. Thank that you. Was that was impactful. Yes. Did you enjoy that? Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it again myself. <laughs> so many incredible leadership nuggets. 
And so I want to thank Minister uh, uh, Dantasia Jackson. Excellent job. Pastor Singleton, as always. <laughs> good job. Good so job. So much information. That was such an awesome and rich exchange. And so if you want to learn more about how you can increase your influence, the Victory Association would like to invite you to every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., just five classes. We will start on Wednesday, September 8th. That'll be our first session, and we're titling it The Leader in mm -hmm. You. You can do a deeper dive in these five subjects that we just talked about now. Influence, priorities, character, creating positive change, and problem solving. Just go to Victory's new website, vacmattison.org. You can register under events. The cost is free, but the capacity is limited. So we want you to er register early. And remember, everything rises and falls on leadership. God bless everybody. God bless, God bless you. you. Come get your victory. Get your